Hi, and welcome to Common Denominator, straight up conversations with me, Moshe Popak. Each week I chat with pioneers, innovators, and truly inspirational people to learn the steps they take to turn their ideas into reality. My goal is to empower you to dive in, be bold, and take profound steps toward realizing your own potential. This week's guest is Scott Melker. Scott's a cryptocurrency trader and investor, the host of the popular The Wolf of All Streets podcast, and a prolific writer and thought leader in the crypto space. He'll share secrets of the crypto trade, where it's headed, and why you might want to invest in it next. This is Common Denominator, straight up conversations with Moshe Popak. Now, here's Moshe. Hi, Scott. Welcome to the show. Hi, right, man. Thanks for having me. So, when I first heard about, kind of as a layperson, concepts of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain, a whole new world seems intimidating. So, maybe let's go through each one and maybe we can advise the audience at least on that. So, so we'll start with cryptocurrency. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's very simple at the most basic level for a new person. You can just say it's digital money, right? It's a very o- obvious concept if you think about the history of almost everything that we consume, right? I mean, music, we used to buy records, buy CDs, move digital. Now you spend uh, 10, 12 bucks on a monthly Spotify account and you can share your music with your whole family. Same thing with almost every single medium that we consume. And I think it's clear that the world is moving towards more technology and digital money is going to be a part of that, whether cryptocurrency or otherwise. I think even, you know, the cash that we consume, central banks will start using digital currencies. That's just the future. So cryptocurrencies at the core is a wide variety of things. I think probably focus on Bitcoin first, which is a deflationary cryptocurrency based on blockchain technology and cryptography. Basically, what it, what I'm telling you is there's 21 million of them ever. They're slowly created by mining, which is basically solving a mathematical formula. And they will eventually all be mined, and that will be all the Bitcoin there ever is. And then there's the concept of blockchain, which I know is the core foundation of how cryptocurrency is, is traded and, and used. Yeah, a blockchain technology is, is very simple, right? Most of the things, the data that we store at present are on centralized servers. You've seen these huge server farms all over the world where all of our data goes and it's stored. Well, this basically decentralizes and distributes that. Like I said, there's miners and what they do is they basically verify transactions by solving a complicated mathematical equation. A certain amount of transactions are locked into a block. That block is then put into a chain. Another one is is uh, mined and then all those transactions are verified. You have this endless chain which can, cannot be hacked because A, each one is locked. So even if you were managed to hack one block of the blockchain, it would be irrelevant. You wouldn't have access to everything. And it's completely decentralized around the world to all of the miners uh, and not centralized on servers. So basically, it's money that's not controlled by anyone. uh, And you have this public distributed ledger. So it seems also that's, I guess, since 1971, we got off the gold currency that really, because we're not actually physically printing money. It's like there's the you know, central bank and, and everything is kind of, you know, digital in, in a way because we're just kind of looking at our, even before cryptocurrency came around, um, I guess it, it now it's kind of global, um, accepted globally, this, this currency. We've, we've hyper, um, you know, expanded this, this concept of, of digital currency, it seems. Sure, I think that's accurate. I mean, truly, the gold standard ended in the early 1900s. We had sort of a bastardized bastardized version of the gold standards until the 1970s, where the dollar was theoretically backed by gold, and then all other currencies were theoretically using the dollar as a global reserve currency. And of course, Nixon famously told them all to screw off and uh, screwed over the entire world by removing the dollar from the gold standard when everyone was depending on us to back the dollar. Um, that's neither here nor there. But yes, as you said, what Bitcoin does, is it effectively decentralizes this completely, not controlled by any government. It's controlled completely by the people. Uh, and Bitcoin is very similar to digital gold. That's sort of the use case that has solidified itself as the core core competency of, of Bitcoin. It's superior to gold in basically every way, shape and form. 
Uh, and again, it's provably scarce. Uh, it would actually make a perfect asset for central banks to back their currencies on. Yeah, and I know just in the past 10 years, it's a tremendous number, $2 trillion worth of value. Um, and I think growing from there because we're seeing, we're seeing institutional investments. We're seeing, um, you know, in the people, uh, companies in the crypto space being listed on the, on the public markets as well. So it's really seems to be getting more and more mainstream. What, what would you say kind of, um, the top in your mind, top, um, you know, reasons why a lay person should invest in cryptocurrency? Because it stores value and it protects and it protects your money, right? I mean, we all know that inflation is real. And if you look at real inflation, the value of your dollar is decreasing. The buying power of your dollar is decreasing markedly every single year, every single day, every single month. I mean, we can see that in obviously reflected in the price of goods that we purchase. Uh, and so you need a way to hedge against that inflation, against that loss of value. And Bitcoin, since it is deflationary, not only is it a store of value, it's almost a misnomer to call it a store of value because it's appreciated over 200% every year in its existence and far more most years. Um, so the real reason is to protect your money. I always like to say that dollars are for spending. I mean, and Bitcoin is for saving, right? I mean, dollars are literally designed to lose their value with time and to get them out of your pocket as fast as humanly possible. That's why wealthy people have always bought hard assets to store their value. And Bitcoin happens to be a superior hard asset to almost all of the other options. Right. So I, I know that 70% of wealth, you know, I'm in, I'm in the real estate business and, uh, Throughout history, right, people owned land and, like you're saying to your point, hard assets. So 70% of wealth today is in real estate. Um, and I guess this will be a major class, according to your view. But there are people that, um, that see, you know, it seems to me the non-regulation of it could lend. I've heard many stories of people getting, um, getting hurt. Uh, investing in different cryptocurrencies. Uh, what do you say? What do you say to that that uh, issue? Uh, have you ever heard of people getting hurt before cryptocurrencies existed? That's I a have. Fair point. Yeah. You ever heard of mail scams, phone scams, ransomware attacks existed even before cryptocurrency? It's a misdirection and it's completely false. We know that most criminal activity has been based on the U.S. dollar since the beginning of time, um, and so it, it's yet again, it's just sort of an attack on Bitcoin in general. But that said, yeah, with uh, with with wanting to be your own bank and store your own value comes great responsibility and you have to be ready to take on that challenge if you're going to custody your own Bitcoin and really do it, I guess, the right way as any Bitcoin maximalist would sort of tell you. Scams are, are rampant in this world regardless. Hacks are rampant in this world regardless. But that's a very, very small percentage of what's happening in this space. So is it more than, uh, you know, susceptible to cyber attacks more than traditional currency or, you know, kind of the same? No, I, what they're saying is that it's easier to get someone to pay the ransom if in Bitcoin than with dollars. But Bitcoin itself is no more susceptible to cyber attacks. In fact, it's arguably the most secure network in the world just because of the decentralization and the way that it's structured. The Bitcoin network itself has never been hacked. And I know... In that, in the uh, uh, space of regulation, I think the head of the SEC, someone just told me, he taught an MIT. Uh, Gary Gensler. Yeah, he taught he taught crypto, um, and now they're kind of saying that putting a huge blanket over saying everything is a security, therefore it's under our jurisdiction, which I think is I think is wild. I mean, that's what it seems like it's happening. So. Uh, it's a bit confusing and there's not much clarity, which has sort of been the MO of the regulators and SEC to this point. Gary Gensler, top blockchain technology at MIT on the surface, looks like a huge proponent for the space. But we also like to call him Goldman Gary because it's a guy who's worth nine figures from, from Wall Street and then went to become a regulator and believes he has the power to protect the consumer when he made a hundred and something million dollars on the backs of those people, obviously. So listen, I, I generally am optimistic that he'll be somewhat wise or will have some sense when it comes to it. But it's very clear already that Bitcoin and Ethereum have effectively been deemed not securities based on the Howey test. There's no company that's benefiting. Um, he would have probably deemed Ethereum a security 
had Hillary Clinton won and him, at which point he probably would have been the head of the SEC uh, at that time if, if Trump had actually lost. So as much as he's a proponent for the space, it may have actually been more damaging over the last four years. We may not have seen the boom in Ethereum and DeFi, everything being built on that if he had been a regulator. But yes, I think that uh, there's a lot of fear that everything other than those two could be deemed a security in some way, shape or form. Then you have people that work at the CFTC who say that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are commodities and that the SEC has no jurisdiction over it. So there's even a battle among the regulators for who's gonna be in power. It's my feeling that we need a third agency, right? I mean, cryptocurrency is a unique asset class, neither a commodity or probably a security like a stock uh, and should be regulated and as such by people who understand it. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. Uh, and you get, you get a, a board of many people from, from that space and, yeah. uh, and, you make, and you make it happen. And I saw, uh, was it a little bit ago, this, uh, this whole booming uh, NFTs, right? It was a piece of art. What was it over 60 million? 69 million. 69 million. Yeah, that was uh, I didn't I didn't understand. I, I looked at it, but I'm sure there are people that completely understand. And because of the I guess the scarcity of that. Tell us a little bit about what is an NFT and why there's a value in that. So NFTs go so much deeper than that, but I don't think that the public knows it. An NFT is a non fungible token, which means basically it's a one off token. Uh, that you can transfer value using. So art collectibles are a very cute usage of an NFT, but the piece of art itself is not the NFT. It's the provability. It's the certificate that says this is the only one and it's the only one that ever will be that you transfer to someone that's truly the NFT. So if you're familiar with the art world, obviously you're probably familiar with the con concept of provenance. Right. Sure. If you sell a $60 million Picasso painting, people want every certificate, every receipt, every piece of paper that was ever attached to it that proved that it's real and that you're getting the real one and that it's not fake. And people have to go to crazy extremes uh, to prove that art is real. And a lot of the time that still isn't enough because people also fake the provenance. Right. So think about the NFT means that I can transfer value directly to you without any third party in between, and you know that what you're getting is authentic. So art, that's one thing. We understand people wanna own things that are scarce, right? I mean, it's the same reason I might go on a website and buy some Jordans, or the same reason that you know people are buying pictures of rocks for a million dollars, which are also yes. a part of the NFT space, right? But it's the same reason that people just like to own sports memorabilia. Any of these things is scarcity, but Digging further than that, that's one thing. Okay, I can prove something is scarce. Think about every single item in the world that's transferred between two people and requires a third party in between, a toll collector that takes a piece of it to verify that it's a real transaction. Every time you send a wire to a bank, from one bank to another, how many people are in between? Spend something on a credit card, mortgage, car title, medical records, every single thing in the world, stocks. Right, You buy a stock. We saw what happened with GameStop on Robinhood. If you yeah. buy a stock, you need to go to a centralized clearinghouse and wait 48 hours for that stock to truly become yours. What if that stock was tokenized and I transferred it directly and we didn't need that third party in between? So non-fungible token, is, they're the future of literally everything. And this is not a, not a statement on the value of the art that's being sold. I think there's absolutely a bubble there to some degrees. I don't know that someone should have paid $69 million for an NFT, but the underlying technology is so much more than what you're seeing in the mainstream, and it's going to change everything. By the way, and I, uh, I do know your background starting off as a DJ. How do you go from there, right, to uh, financial wizard? Well, I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I, I, uh, I said no to a Wall Street job when I graduated because I was more concerned with music, but I always had sort of at least a superficial interest in financial markets. And one thing that comes with being a DJ and producer is a whole lot of free time. So, um, you know, during that free time, I was trading and, and like I said, sort of superficially interested. And when I was retiring from that, I was sort of finding Bitcoin and crypto at the same time in 2016, which just happened to be the right time. I came as a trader. Uh, you know, I, I came for the U.S. dollars and I stayed for the Bitcoin, I guess. I learned why it was so important and it became a lot more uh, important to me to stack Bitcoin than to make dollars and cash out. And that's sort of how I transitioned into it. But the answer is music was always my passion and I sort of aged out. You know, I'm 44 years old. I had kids. I 
you know, the, I'm sure you, uh, you've experienced a hangover in your forties is not exactly like a hangover in your twenties. Uh, I just got too old, man, you know, and I was over it. And so, uh, I, it was a well-timed fortuitous, uh, serendipitous moment. And, uh, I just timed it well enough that I could make it a profession and a lifestyle very quickly because I was in the market at the right time. It's complete luck. Yeah. And I do see also, um, you have your own podcast, Wolf of All Streets. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's cool to be on this side, to be quite honest, because <laughs> I'm so used to asking so many questions. Uh, it was something that I started completely on a whim, actually. A company called Blockworks approached me and asked me if I wanted to do a podcast, and I responded, what's podcast? Hmm. I'd never listened to one in my entire life, wasn't aware of how popular they were. Um, and so I showed up the first day and just started asking people questions. I was terrible at it. It took me... Uh, 50, 100 episodes before I honestly felt like I was even decent at podcasting. But I, I talked to the sort of thought leaders in the space, um, but we branch out beyond just crypto, you know, mu musicians, artists, politicians, uh, athletes, you know, um, and at the very, at the end of the day, of course, it's about Bitcoin and crypto, but it's more about interesting stories about people who have a unique take on finance or on saving or, you know, what to do with your money. A lot of cases with athletes and artists and things like that. But, you know, I, I just try to approach any single person I can, who I think I can learn something from. I call them and they spend an hour with me. It's like a free college education where I get a one-on-one -on -one with the professor. It's really, I mean, I'm sure you know, but it's the greatest job in the world. You call anyone, they want to hear themselves talk, of course. They say yes, and then you just grill them for an hour and you learn a lot. So to yeah. me, it's just an incredible opportunity. I definitely learn from every single guest. So, And I want to say congratulations, 536,000 Twitter followers as well, <laughs> right? It's a, lot, it's a lot of followers, right? It it is. I wonder how many of them are fake or just trolls, but uh, it seems like there's a good percentage there that are real and actually concerned. Twitter is a wild platform, as you know. So, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of the uh, biggie equivalent of Mo Money, Mo Problems. I would say Mo Followers, Mo Problems, because uh, just the percentage of noise, I think, uh, increases. But yeah, it's it's a pretty, cr bit of pretty crazy ride, you know, when I stopped... Uh, Talking about music, I had probably 30 or 40,000 Twitter followers when I ended my music career. Um, and I just, in my own sort of unique way, where I just talk about what I'm passionate about, regardless of anyone, what they want to hear, uh, I just started talking about cryptocurrency. So I lost about half of them very quickly <laughs> who were there for the music and then sort of built back up from 20,000. Uh, I still don't know why so many people follow, but it, it's, it's a trip. So, how could, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for joining the show. How could people learn more about you? Uh, just go to Twitter, Scott Melker at Scott Melker. There's links there to my newsletter, my my uh, my podcast, which comes out two times a week on Tuesday and Thursday. Then I also have a YouTube channel that I started a few months ago where I live stream uh, every single weekday morning at 8.30 a.m., all the news and updates on the market, and three more times a week in, in the afternoons on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I, I create a lot of content. I really, really, truly believe that this is a life-changing opportunity for most people. And so it's very easy to continue to talk to the crypto community, but it's like same people, recycled content. So my goal has always been to bring in more people who don't get it or who have questions or have never heard of it really, uh, you know, the lead the charge towards mainstream adoption. So I just keep making content and trying to reach every person that we can. Yeah, very admirable. Everybody should uh, be in abundance. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, and uh, only blessings. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the Common Denominator Podcast. Join us next week for another inspiring, impactful, and empowering conversation. To learn more about Moshe, head to moshapopak.com. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it. And we'd be grateful if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the show.